has labored, he has suffered to lead his people into the land of freedom. He is the Redeemer and the Child. So we have not even gone beyond the first person voting and there's chaos, absolute chaos here. What the members of parliament should know is that the world is watching Ghana. This is a democracy that has been celebrated time and time again as the beacon of hope and good governors and good governors. But it looks like it is degenerating here on the floor of parliament. This is absolutely. And now, cut calls are reigning supreme. Members are. <laughs> Interesting cut calls there from members of the NDC caucus. It looks like some sanity is prevailing now. 
sanity is prevailing now. The, ND, the, the, the minority caucuses, as some members, some members of the NDC caucus, are asking for the colleagues to move out. Spearheaded by uh, uh, Governor Kwame Abuja. It looks like they want a workout. What happens if they walk out? What happens if they walk out? What will happen if they walk out? Well, if they walk out, uh, I think the business continues. Um, uh, business will continue. I'm not sure business will come to a halt. I don't subscribe to the interpretation put on Article 93 or so that, you know, uh, that there should be uh, about 140 MPs in the house and, and, and that kind of thing. I, I don't subscribe to that. I'm just trying to get to that provision to read exactly what it is to you. So there shall be a parliament of Ghana which shall consist of no less than 140 elected members. And many people have interpreted that to mean that at every point in time or at a time like this, when parliament is about to be inaugurated, you should have a house which is more than 140 members. And so if one side of the two decides to walk out, then it means that uh, we won't have 140 MPs in the House because the MPP obviously doesn't have 140 and the NDC also doesn't have 140, so it means that Parliament cannot be inaugurated. I don't subscribe to that school of interpretation. I think that provision is spent. Uh, that provision, in my view, was the, the minimum threshold uh, in terms of number of seats we should have you know, in the Republic. And as we speak now, we have 275 seats and so 275 MPs. Uh, I think if a side works out, the business of the House will continue. They will elect a speaker and it will be deemed as a speaker duly elected by the House. This is the Parliament of Ghana. The most, the closest in terms of the gaps, in terms of the gap, the difference in numbers. And now, voting is supposed to take place for a speaker, one out of 275, and there's already a fight over whether secret ballot in the sense of the word or not. Because the, uh, the MPP caucus wants to insist on every member voting for Professor Michael Quinn to ensure that they have the speaker. What a task is going to be for the chairperson, Sir Linsian, to stir the affairs of this parliament, of, the, uh, of this sitting, to ensure the election of a speaker. Absolute. I mean, we know tonight was going to be interesting. I have. It looks like there's some resolution now. Yeah, it looks like the. the, the it is either stupid ballot or nothing else. Honorable members, please be seated. <laughs>
We are live on the channel and of course where you need to be this morning. We are live on the Facebook page of Pan African Television. We are also live on a YouTube page of Pan African Television. Of course, we are live on several affiliates across the country. A big thank you to uh, Volta One TV in Ho that's currently carrying us live. And of course Global FM also in Ho. Among the several other affiliates we have. A big thank you to Adam Fopan Media and Paris for giving us their platform also on Facebook. Thank you for joining us. My name is Senna Numbo. On behalf of the crew here at Pan African Television, I say uh, a good morning to you, and I hope you had a wonderful week, very interesting week, specifically what happened in the wee hours of Thursday morning. So interesting was it that the inauguration and swearing in of the president looked very, very dull because parliament was the center of attention. And of course, we'll be talking about that this morning. And then we'll spend some time, having moved on from the swearing-in of the MPs and also the swearing-in of the president, the issue that confronts us now is the election petition. In fact, there are several other petitions in court, some relating to uh, certain parliamentary seats. And also the bigger one, that's the petition at the Supreme Court regarding the presidential results that will start henceforth. And we'll be spending some time on that on our second round of discussions. Joining me. In the studio for the discussions today, Mr. Kwesi Prajini, Jr. was managing editor of Insight News with a regular panelist on the show. Mujib Rahman join us, joins us today. He's a member of the MPP's communication team. And the immediate past, the deputy communication spokesperson of the National Democratic Congress. National, uh, Margaret Anse, popularly known as Mago, joins us. We are expecting Kodjo Chumbuafo, who is a leading member of the National Democratic Congress, to join us pretty shortly. We are back with the discussions on the dissolution of the seventh parliament and of course the swearing of the speaker and what happened prior to that immediately after this break we'll start with uh, the woman to my left margaret and say on that particular issue after this break Morning is an important time of the day because how you spend your morning can often tell you what kind of day you're going to have. I want you to have a great day. So start your day with me because I can guarantee a great show every weekday on Good Morning Africa right here on Pan-African Television. I will be serving some inspiration, news, business, health, newspaper review, music, and so much more. Join me, Kwame. Kwame Owusu Danso on Good Morning Africa on Pan-African Television. Let's have a truly African morning. Medasi. Welcome back from that break. It's a matter of all talk shows. Alagi and Alagi. Here we say it is as it is, no matter who is involved in the end. We'll leave you better educated. Once again, 
welcome. And we are starting the discussion of with the dissolution of the seventh parliament. Of course, the eighth parliament currently is a one in session. Uh, they are on a break there to return on Friday. But we are spending some time in parliament, especially in the very early hours of Thursday, the 7th of January 2020. And like I indicated, Mago will start a discussion for us. Good morning. And thanks for joining us. Good morning, Sina. And a happy new year. Many happy return. Yeah, to you, your team, your cherished viewers, and those watching us on Facebook Live and the other media, broadcast media, your affiliates. And a special happy new year to my brother from the MPP and Uncle Chrissy. And good morning to us all. So now it's, it's been a good year, especially for me from the NDC. And uh, going around with, the, with our flag bearer campaigning throughout the 16 administrative regions. And what we saw, the love, the clear sign of we want change. And on the December 7th, the voting, the challenges started from the counting, then the coalition. But what we saw during the campaign reflected in the voting. So I have to say a special good morning and a happy new year to all Ghanaians. They really voted for change. The love and the enthusiasm they showed, they transferred it into making statements on election day. The NDC, we appreciate them a lot. Every region, they did their best. And we know they voted for change. Sena, two days ago, something happened in Parliament. It is constitutional that at the end of a first four term, like first term of the presidency and the parliamentarians, parliament must dissolve to swear in the new parliament. So we were all expecting the norm. And because of the numbers, the NDC on our side, we also proposed our leadership and also suggested that uh, uh, Honorable Alban Suman Ababin should also be uh, speaker. Therefore, it required that sh we should go into voting. So every normal person will expect that as the Constitution says and as the standing orders of Parliament says, it should be secret voting. You go, you cast your vote, you go and sit down. At the end of the day, the clerk conducted the elections and will declare whoever is the winner. But we didn't see that on that day. Also, you could clearly see that there was lack of communication. Because as of that day, we didn't know who is the majority, who is the minority. There was no communication because it was supposed to be done with the clerk and the leaders, looking at the numbers. So we decided to go early and sit in the majority seats because we have the same numbers. The independent candidate is not a political party and is not an MPP person. So all those drama unfold. The clerk was supposed to conduct the election of the speaker in the absence of no speaker. For their standing orders, that is the only activity of the clerk. But that day we realized that the clerk superimposed certain powers onto himself, trying to determine who is eligible to vote, who has been served, and who should work out. That was not part of the clerk's job. It was highly unconstitutional. He was only supposed to conduct the election of the speaker. So when his attention was drawn to, he should have allowed, I mean, be within his lane, allow the election to go on, and tell whoever wanted to bring that issue up to send it to the speaker when the speaker is elected. Unless there were certain stage or certain things behind the scene to compromise the whole thing. Other than that, it was not in his place to even ask who is supposed to vote and who is not supposed to vote and who has been said. And amazingly, a clerk, you are not supposed to be said by a bailiff. You are supposed to be copied. The courts are the Cape Coast High Courts, 
ended its proceedings around 4.44. And the clerk said he had the bailiff at 4.55. And we were wondering that within that 11 minutes, what kind of drone or private jet, how did the bailiff get to parliament on that busy day to serve the clerk? In the end, it turned out to be a lie. The clerk lied. Was he compromised? That notwithstanding, voting was supposed to proceed. You, the clerk conducting elections. You saw MPs showing, voting and showing their votes to their leadership. Why? Sena, I grew up to meet a democratic Ghana. We've gone into an election. In the just ended December 7th election, the police arrested people who even took pictures. I think they were in the news. Those that went to the booth voted and took pictures. Some of them were arrested. So why will we use secret voting to vote for an MP to come and sit in parliament? Then that MP will go and do open, I don't know how you call it, if it's a new strategy. You vote and you show. For what purpose? To what intent? What, what were they trying to achieve? But, Sena, all the things that the NDC kept saying from, from, from the time Charlotte said was removed, Jemensa came, all the things from that moment till now, by the grace of, a special grace of a deity, almighty, whatever, all those things came to bear. In Parliament, if our MPs hadn't stood up to protect and defend what is constitutional, the story would have been different. You went to Tachima and South, the people were vulnerable, they couldn't defend themselves. You went to Takwa and Suyayim, the people were vulnerable, they couldn't defend themselves. You went to Sashiri or so, you did all that over there. And you expect the parliamentarians that the people who were so vulnerable couldn't defend themselves, the parliamentarians that they had the power to defend themselves to, you expected them to sit down and watch them do what they did before. Then later they'll tell us to go to court. No. We have realized that Nanado Danko Kufuado do not understand conventional elections. So what they did to our people, what they did to the ordinary Ghanaian who couldn't voice out, the parliamentarians will not come and sit down for them to do the same. They will not forgive them. They will not. So the powers that they gave to the parliamentarians, it is the power that they exhibited at parliament the other day. If the people were so vulnerable and they couldn't stand up to the military and they had to run, results had to be changed. You cannot come and do the same thing to the parliamentarians. No, the people are giving them the power. And they have the power to define what you took away from their people. If we had a result, what happened? So now I bet you the story would have been different. The story would have been different. And they would, they would tell it in their own way. And later tell us to go to court. Because now, even when you do, I, I, the students will be going to school very soon. I think when teachers mark students down, their teachers will tell the students to tell the teachers to go to court for their rights. Now everything, ordinary mathematics, they will tell you to go to court. I don't know whether the Supreme Court are made up of uh, remedial uh, uh, examiners or they mark their, their, their examiners for marking marks, whatever. Common arithmetic, they will tell you to go to court. And we didn't sit down for them to tell us to go to court. We will not. Look at what happened. Look at the drama. From Madame Eslowusu, from the voting and showing to their, their people, from the, marsh, the deputy marshal, whether he was putting a seal on the, on, the, on the ballot box or whatever. We have witnessed ballot staffing in December 7th elections. We witnessed it. Over voting and whatever. The NDC went prepared. So now, going, winning, or the spirit of winning, everybody can have it. But to prepare to win, that is the difference. We prepared to win the speakership position the other day. And we won. And I must congratulate 
our MPs. They did very well. Our national executive, our flag bearer, our leaders, council of state, whatever. All those who went into this meeting, oriented them, gave them, gave them the courage to stand up to their rights because the masses have voted for them. We congratulate all of them. And they did very well. We really came prepared. And the MPP, they, I think they advised themselves. When you are losing elections, you bring militia, the burger bulldogs, whatever, to come and shoot people. Then you hear members of parliament describing them as armed robbers. I never knew we had guns that would shoot into crowd and the pits, the, 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 how do you call it, the, the, the bullets can identify criminals. Because in Tetriman South, they shot through the crowd. Several injured, two people died, later one died. Then you describe them as criminals. Did the bullets identify criminals among the crowd? What would Chairman Sabosu call Carlos Ahinkra? Have you seen the master criminal in parliament now? What will uh, their, 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 their first deputy, what's his name, Joe Weiss? I want him to describe Carlos. Because Carlos... Criminality is bewildered. Carlos is the master of all criminals. If he claims that those that were shot, because at the polling station, I don't know what they are going to steal at the polling station or at the coalition center. The 15-year-old girl who died at Ododiodio, what did she steal? What did she steal? Is she also a criminal? The young girl who died in the Buno East region, what did she do? The MPP want to get power at all costs. At the detriment of even the nation, they don't care. Everything they want because they feel they are first class citizens and the NDC, we are second class citizens. It is the love and the democracy that we've all built. So now I didn't grow up to come and meet a, a, a Ghana that was undemocratic. But at least our parents taught us what happened. Severally, there have been wars and nobody is calling for war. But therefore, we must devise other intelligent means and register our protests. The MPs did so well. And we are telling the NPP that this is just the beginning. There is no human being, as Nanado said, every person has two balls. Whatever the ball is, he understands. But every human being has it. And we will not allow them to, to have their way. You are going for ordinary election in parliament and you realize that things were not going well. You are bringing in the army. And I saw the MPP MPs comfortably seated. I see the army came for the NDC MPs. Bullets, it doesn't discriminate. If anything had happened on that day, or they have bullets that identify NDC people. As Joy said, some were criminals. I expected the NPP MPs to join the NDC MPs to drive away the, 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 the army. The soldiers who came into parliament. What is their business in parliament? You go to parliament chamber with invitation. What was their intention? Who invited them? The clerk or the marshal? Who? We have about three lieutenant colonels as marshal in parliament with over 50 soldiers. We have the police unit. What do they need those people who came into the chambers of parliament for? And why were the MPP MPs comfortably seated? Because they felt it was normal, because they were assured someone has brought them in to come and shoot at their NDC MPs. This is an indictment on, on, on parliament. This is highly undemocratic. This was a coup d'etat. Parliament would have been vulnerable because in any coup, the first place that you can go to is parliament. What if one of these soldiers are taking a mic and said we are taking over? Because we didn't have a president, we didn't have a, 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 a speaker. What were they thinking, those that gave the orders? Even the colonial days, the zombies that the whites were using, they wouldn't even do what these people are doing now. The soldiers, the police, that's the colonial days we're using. They will not even do what the MPP is doing today. The impunity. What has come over them? You can't have your way, so use the military. Use the police. In parliament, even in parliament. 
we thank God that all that we said that went on during the December 7th election, it's manifested in Parliament. For the whole world to see, and even after the election of the speaker, some of them were like, we, 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 should, we, should, cons we, we should say that uh, Makokwe withdrew from the race and he didn't contest. Because what? And Mgwasi and Fata Makokwe. What? What, what, where do they come from? Who even created them? From the universe. <laughs> Who created this type of people? We have gone into an election center, we saw people voting, we saw all the drama and all the things that happened in that guest house. Then in the end, you have lost, and you want us to say that you didn't contest. When they were advising him initially not to contest, why didn't he listen? What is this? I said, now, thank be to God. We have the speakership now. Democracy won. We have to thank the heroes and the heroines of the MPP who saw the nation's interest first before any other personal interest or somebody's instructions. They were voted for by citizens and they must do what is right for the nation. In all that we are doing, all that the NDC did, it was for the interest of the nation. Democracy must rule the truth must stand. And that is what happened. But we had to fight it. We all knew that election is going to, to the polling center, take your ballot paper, go and stamp it, put it in the box. But Nanado Danko Kufuado, he does not believe in that. Therefore, anybody that you, you any time you are going into an election with him, you have to fight. The NDC, we did not just believe in peace. But we, we respected the will of the people. That is why in 2016, Afloat conceded. He called him even before he made a press statement to the, to, 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 to the people. Not just because we wanted peace, but we respected the will of the people. Why can't they do the same? Even when they are losing, they want to intimidate us. You did it to the vulnerables at the polling station, and now you want to come and do it to the parliamentarians, your colleagues in parliament. Why? Because somebody called Manado must be president and must have, he should have his way all the time because he's a special child. Or what? Or he was made by a certain deity and we were made by a different person. We are not going to allow that to happen. What you took from the vulnerables at the polling st stations, we will not allow you to take it from us here. Like the constituency, they will not forgive them. They have fought well, and you can imagine how happy their constituents are. Because what they couldn't do, the MPs have done it for them. And everything still indicates that. Nanado Dankwe Kufuado did not win this December 7th election, Sena. He did not. Look at what Carlos, Carlos. Look at what he did. After ballot papers have been sorted, you went and took ballot papers. I didn't know where he was going. To understand that he even chewed some of the papers. Such barbaric acts from a member of parliament representing people of Tema West. Abba. All because they didn't have their way. And they must do every means possible to have their way. Then in the next minute, the president will come and say that the Ghanaians want us to work together. So let's do the process. When you brought the army to, to Parliament House, you didn't know they were supposed to build consensus. When did Namado Dankwe Kufuado, when, when did he lo, know a consensus building? When? When? When did that word come into his dictionary? When Charlotte Osei was removed? When Jemensa was imposed on us? Was it the re re registration time? When he was closing down radio stations which belonged to the opposition? When he was sending the, the, the military to go and fight COVID-19 in the opposition stronghold, was he calling for consensus building? What is he telling us? That Ghanaians want us to work together. Which Ghanaian voter went to the poll and voted for Nanadu, voted for Nanadu and voted for uh, John Mahama at the same time? Ghanaians voted for change. He shouldn't just say things to make himself happy. Nobody voted for him and uh, John Mahama at the same time. No. Nobody voted for NDC MP and voted for MPP MP at the same time. That vote would have been sports ballot. Who told him that? Why is he deceiving himself? He did not win the election. And as our general secretary said, we will not recognize him as such. Ghanaians voted for change. 
So he should wake up from his sleep. And nobody is going to sit down with him in any concern. What good has he got for this country? Is it a Japa that we should, we should sit down with him and agree on? Is it boss scandal? Is it the 11 air conditions in two bedroom apartments? Is it the crow and associates? Is it the by force leave of the uh, auditor general? Which one? Is it about PDS? What good has he got for this country that he's calling for consensus? Why? This same Akufuado, when he was elected in 2016, there were certain discussions among certain high people of this country between himself and our flag bearer. When he went and read the speech that was plagiarized and the people were trolling him, he came out to deny it. And his guys, his, his flag staff house, uh, Facebook flag staff house staffers, were calling John Muhammad that you, you've been a president and you don't have an apartment. You, you are now begging for us to give you an apartment. Something that he is entitled to. Nana Dodankwa today is calling for what consensus building. Between who and who? Our parliamentarians are in parliament to protect the public purse. The NDC parliamentarians were voted to go and confront that arrant impunity of the executive. Our parliamentarians are in parliament to do the right thing for this country, not to do what Nanadu wants. Today, Nana is in the fix. So he's calling for consensus building. From who? Is it the same NDC? Are they calling it from the incompetent NDC? Are we now competent to sit down with Nanadu Danko Ekufuado? Oh, where are their men? The Nanadu Danko Ekufuado, who has all the powers in this country, to tell our, our, our national chairman that he did not close radio stations. Where is he going to do? Who? Who is he going to sit down with and call for that? He should never deceive himself that Ghanaians voted for us to work together. Ghanaians voted for change. And change we must have. It is the change we will get. Nobody voted for NDC and NPP at the same time. <coughs> This is not the first time Nanadu Danko Ekufuadu is becoming a president. We've seen, we've seen, we saw him last four years. The disrespect, the impunity, the abuse of power. We saw him. The arrogance, the great loot and share, the family and friends, the insult on Ghanaians, the hardship on Ghanaians. And he's coming today to tell us. We, we Ghanaians want us to work together. Even in Parliament, when we were supposed to choose a speaker, he brought the, 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 the military guys to come and intimidate us. The same people he wants to work with. No way. Our MPs will not succumb to such cluelessness, such carelessness, such impunity. So now we thank God for our speaker. We won. Ghanaians won. Democracy has won. That is the most important thing. And let's just relax and see how things unfold. We are going to do the right thing in Parliament. We are still contesting the other seats that they twisted our arms to take. A Sikado Kenten is there. How can you prevent a PC from entering a coalition center? Because somebody called Jogate has done it all over the years and he's gotten away with it. Look at what happened in Sashiri also. Even Techiman South. We are contesting all those seats. And by the grace of God, the truth will stand again. And the NDC will get a clear majority. We are not going to sit down with anybody to, to build consensus. or to what, what good have they, have they got? What? We've seen them in the last four years. What? They have all the powers. They were working shoulders high. Insulting everybody. If you correct them, you are insulted. If, if you try to do the, to, to say the right thing or to advise them, they come after you. They want to. This president, Sam George, was an MP, was beaten at a by-election. Then pre this president issues a white paper and says that the person that slapped the MP was provoked. Nanadu told us that as soon as you are angry, you can slap anybody. And it's accepted. Today, is he calling Sam George to come and sit down and do what? Have you seen how the world is? John Boyd, who was calling our bluff, that if we don't cooperate, they won't even give us the second deputy speaker or whatever, was later begging 
You see how the world is? You see? Nobody has absolute power. All powers belongs to God. And he give it to the people that he wants. Even to the lowest person. Mr. Akufuadu should learn lessons. At least for the past few days. He should go and, and, and have a deep thought and think through and humble himself. Maybe God will have mercy on him. But for us, we cannot sit down and have a tete-a-tete -tete with Nanado Dankwe Kufuadu. He does not respect human rights. does not respect the law. Look at the affluent. Look at what happened in parliament. Then the next minute, you are calling for consensus. The people that you wanted to come and kill. The people that you Because from, from the posture of the MPP MPs, they were comfortably seated as if nothing has happened. Someone comes evade parliament, the army, fully armed, which is not constitutional, which is wrong, and you were comfortably seated because you have been assured that, no, 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 the bullet is not coming after you. It's coming after the, the, the NDC. Nanado is taking us backward. And we should not allow it. What has happened for 100 years, we will never forget. Parliamentarians are in their house, in their chambers, going about their business. They could have taken a whole day to select a speaker. Why, why are they in a hurry? What is it? Because Nana has they've even done a brochure that uh, 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 they, 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 they are right, honorable, the old man, was his picture was in it. When they had opportunity to change, they couldn't even change his wife's name. So right Reverend Alban Bagwin's wife was Magokwe's wife in the brochure. They didn't even believe in democracy. They know that they will have their way. They will come and use the military to... You see? But God has exposed them. You know, we thank providence for the grace and the exposure. And how he has exposed the MPP to the world. Now we've all seen what we complain about in December 7th election. But I'll say thank you again to our MPs and to all the team that assisted us to let democracy win. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mago, uh, starting the show for us uh, this morning, let me just do a few messages, and then I'll move on to Mujib. Farouk Razak says, if the election of the speaker, uh, Bambagwin took place in a remote constituency like Sekuyo, so Nanado will have used the military and military then to attend the results in favor of my Okwe, as usual, you say. Thank you. Uh, Commander Edmondson says, turning the constitution down has been the work of the MPP. Pride and arrogance have been their posturing, trying to change our hard-won history. Fadwan says, that's for today, dear. Please, today, dear. <laughs> Say, I don't expect Mujib to be as his usual. And throw that into the good citizens of this country who are watching this show. <laughs> Fadwan says, <laughs> very interesting. Fadwan, thank you. Uh, Awaka Tajudin says, thank God the NDC has very young and energetic guys. Well, thank you very much. You say, Muntaro. The Mutaro Mohammed Habib says a good morning. He's watching us live from Tamil. You are number one in Ghana. I love you. And he says he loves GM and the NDC. To God bless and guide your station. Thank you. Um, you said Kiss from Boyd Bedu says a uh, good morning. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me. Okay. Kofi uh, Abuaji Dankwa says greetings. Uh, Madam is spicing the show this morning. A real woman with class, eloquent speech, beautiful outfit. In fact, I'm blessed not to have missed today's show. Waiting for Comrade Crazy Press comments patiently. May God bless us. Zakaria Flex. Oh, yes, yes. In Central Region, which radio station can I listen to your program? I think we are, we are on Benya FM. I think so. Uh, I, I just need to confirm that. Uh, I'll get some up update for you shortly. Honorable Tagbo says, if a normal person can name himself oh, no, sorry sorry I started reading that. Is that Highness Don Don says, Senator, good morning. The clerk of parliament must be investigated and sacked. Then we have corrupted every institution including parliament. Ransmia Idriso uh, from Adafo says, you have never read oh, now that I'm reading your message for the first time, what I've seen is you have never read my message. So if you had sent the message that you wanted to send, perhaps I have read it. 
Eric Bakwa says, Ghana and her MPs in Parliament were so hilarious and frightening. Fear delegates, fear MPs mantra will exist forever. Uh, says it regards to Honorable Frank and not Dopre. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, Rosalina Tilba is also joining us, saying a happy new year to you. Jacob, uh, Papa Busum Tree Sam says, Why does the MPP, why is the MPP always trying to change the constitution to favor them? Uh, Ladi Yelibak says, Good morning, Pan African TV. I can't listen, to, I can't wait to listen to words of wisdom from Mr. Pratt watching live from Europe, for the, from the European capital of Belgium. In fact, I have to go to two other panelists before I get to Mr. Pratt. Uh, it. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Sena, thank you very much and happy new year to you and your crew and a special happy new year to Uncle Kosuprat and my good sister Mago, even though we always had our difference but <laughs> and to your cherished uh, viewers out there both within and without so now I can understand the angle at which my sister is coming from. If you look at her submission this morning, she is very elated and very excited about what happened in Parliament. And I can understand because uh, it's not their fault and it's not her fault because there's a saying in my local language, Wale, that to it, if you hit your leg and fall, you don't look at where you fall, you fell, you look at where you hit your leg. So now I think for the past four years, the story was different. But this time around, the story is different from what we experienced the last four years. It is about the numbers. The close, almost the same numbers that we have in Parliament. If you recall in the 2016 election, it was clear, 169 against 1060. And I believe at that time, Magu and the rest could not speak the way they are speaking. But I think that I am happy... After the election, the party has constituted a team to actually go around and find out why we are where we are today. It is very, very important, I think, that everybody has to be responsible by his or her own actions towards where we are now. Because if you look at the presidential and the parliamentary results, in fact, there's a lot you can deduce that something really did not go well in terms of managing or in terms of getting people to, to, to stand on the ticket of the new patriotic party. And you can't just go as an entity, as a serious political party, just close your, 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 your arms and say, okay, everything is okay, let's move forward. And I think that it has to be looked at and exactly what the party has done. Fine. So now, going into parliament, this is what happened on 7th December 2020, especially with parliamentary. Is what we have carried into Parliament and what has played out for us in, in just about uh, on, on the 7th of January. So now, but when I look at the pressure of the NDC caucus in Parliament and per after the incidents, the reports from some of them and the commentary from some of the MPs from the NDC, it is clear and conclusive that they went into parliament with a position and a mind that if we don't get this one, then there's going to be trouble. The fact is, when you look at both sides, the NDC caucus and the MPP caucus, the, 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 all the troubles, all the, the happenings were coming from the NDC, NDC, NDC caucus. It started when Afenyo Markin got up to draw the attention of the clerk that there was court injunction on one of the NDC members that because of that he can't take part in the voting. I think that is where the whole beef started. And it is not the fault of Honorable Afenyo Markin, but that is what you and I also know before even they convened to elect the Speaker of Parliament. They had the Cape Coast Court has placed an injunction on a Honorable J.T. Kwesin, NDC Member of Parliament for Asin North, not to, to, to take part. But I think that with the mind and how they all, they were briefed before they got into the house, they were not ready to budge and they were not ready to, to, to give in. They stood on their grounds, 
they argue come as constitutional lawyers all the articles in the constitution were quoted to support their argument but the bottom line is that we ask ourselves was it court injunction on him or not but i think that the voting has gone he has he took part in all the processes but i know like what the minority leader said i don't know this he will be fighting that in court and that if that may not aggravate his situation because now your nationality is being questioned and now it's going to you have gone to contempt of court it's also going to add up but let's see how things will pan out but but I disagree with my sister Mago saying that they are not ready to any consensus building. They are moving ahead. The president was emphatic and we had to govern this country. Mago, the president mentioned consensus or is prepared to work with everybody across every level because of the people that voted for the NDC, because of the future of the 6 million people that today. You are now talking at your feet because of the future of the people of this country. We may not like it, but we had to work together to improve the living conditions of the people of Ghana. That is very basic. Because what I'm coming, I am coming, my sister. I am coming, I am coming, I am coming. Fine. It is an improvement of what we had experienced in the last four years. I want to ask a question. We were part, and we all took part to get the policies of the Adudamqua administration in the last four years, of which we are experiencing a very stable and a very conducive national health insurance that we have in this country. To, to, you were there, you were part of the policy in approval rate, approval level of what we are experiencing of free senior high school in this country. So all the noble policies that were introduced by the last administration, with the 100, the 106 members of parliament of the opposition has also played their part. And that is the future of the people of this country. So if you don't want to cooperate and you don't want to take part in the governance process of this country, what is your business being in parliament? Or what is your business as an opposition leader? Even the critique that you are here critiquing this morning, it is to further shape the political discussion and the forward march of this country, which is welcome. So what is your problem? Because you have lost election, you have beefed, so Ghana should come to stand still. And I believe maybe upon the second one, my sister will change her position. And many others who are thinking like her. But Sina, it is true we need to condemn the actions, some of the issues that took place in Parliament. I have been hearing a contradicting views as to how the military got into Parliament. And remember, Parliament is master of their own rules. And these are very matured and competent people. Uh, this is the first time, stand for correction, to have seen things almost degenerated into fiscal uh, scaffold in, in, in the house. But I think and believe that, and I'm convinced, by and large, uh, cool heads would have prevailed. Because if you recall, at any point that the tempest or the voices were high, you could see KT Hamon from the NPP caucus and Kennedy and Japan from the NPP caucus trying to get to the NDC caucus to try to calm them down. That, that tells us that these are mature guys in parliament that the electors have elected, even though they belong to different political party and have different views on what they were there to do and different position. But I think at the end of the day, maybe we couldn't have reached to a point that some, of, some people were anticipating that. But, but, but let's also uh, uh, be very kindly to ourselves. So I ask my, myself a question. Sometimes you want to become more patriotic and you can go overboard. So that is why you could see certain individual behavior that is not conformed to uh, an honorable position. But I think that at the end of the day, it is Ghana that won. And you, rec you look at the president's speech has worked with Honorable Albert Bagbin for a very long time in Parliament. And, 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 and that is what the people of Ghana, the people of Ghana decided. So if we hadn't had almost the same numbers in Parliament, the story would have been different. I hope you are getting the argument. But also, the NDC knew what they were, they were doing. Because if they hadn't been able at a point to get to the, to reach consensus and get the Speaker of Parliament, Deputy Speaker of Parliament, and the Deputy 
uh, uh, second deputy speaker elected. That would have gone to affect the inauguration and the, the swearing in of the president. And if you recall, many people, dignitaries, presidents, vice presidents of different countries traveled into Ghana just to, to witness and take part in the ceremony. So what was going on in parliament was actually could have actually affected the whole process of the transition. So at a point, you need to sit down and reflect and say, fine, give in, but let us also go ahead with the whole process. Well, imagine, I think they started around 10 p.m. on that day. Up to almost dawn, it was still difficult as to the direction, which, which side was winning. So what were, we ex what were we going? So if they had allowed them, they would have carried to another eight hours. And it will still be the same thing. Because you and I cannot go there and direct them what to do. I hope you, you, you got my point. So I, I think that it was a wise decision that the, in this MPP caucus has to say, fine, let's allow the process to go, even though there's a court injunction, and which felt that is an in, 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 illegality. Let's allow the process to go eventually. Honorable Bagbin, then now right Honorable Speaker of Parliament, won, and we congratulated him. And that paved the way for both the NDC MPP caucus to now have the deputy speaker, which is Joe Ose Usu, and then the uh, only independent candidate in parliament from the MP Andrew Sesiama, also becoming second deputy speaker of parliament. I can only wish them well, and I can only entreat that you go into elections with one mind, to get the opportunity to serve your people in different levels. So if you have given the opportunity, you don't need to flex with it. What you need to do is to contribute your quota to the progress of your own people at any level so that tomorrow you can raise your head and say, I was part of the process and it was through me all these developmental programs that has happened in this particular area. But to take an entrenched position because you have lost the executive, therefore we will not cooperate with the government to improve on the living conditions of the people of Ghana tells how unpatriotic some people can be. I don't pray we get there, but when we get there, I think the literate, the same people that give them the power will tell them that no, that is not why we put you there. So, Sina, I think that let's, let's, elections are over. And to the point, I listened to the press conference of the NDC addressed by their general secretary, articulated their position. It's part. If you tell me, Mago, that the president of the Republic of Ghana today doesn't believe in conventional politics and therefore consensus, that is not true. That is not true. And if you want to tell us that he only go for, if it is, it is not him, no any other person, that is equally is not true. Because in 2012 elections, the president lost, which 2008, the president lost to then Professor Fifi Atamils. May his soul rest in perfect it with a close margin. But the president did accept the results of the people, of the results, and considered defeat. And so now, 2012, the same thing. The president accepted, even though he disagreed and challenged the results of the election at the EPS court. But he didn't call for people to go onto the street and be demonstrating and causing trouble like what we are experiencing today. So today, if you want to place President Nanado Danko Akufuado and former President John Dramani Mahama, who is a Democrat and who is a statesman, per what we are experiencing today, right after all these things, yesterday I think in Volta region and other parts of the country, people took to the street and were demonstrating seriously with their red uh, attire just to demonstrate to the, to, the, to, the people of the, to the people of the world that they are still not agreed to what has happened under whose instructions. If we have a leader and all these things are happening, what will that benefit you? But I think that that goes to confirm, uh, to, 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 like what the agenda secretary said, they will not recognize the president until all the court processes are over. It's within their right. But we believe that per what has happened, a difference of over 500,000 we still want to challenge. We are only here and we are watching how things will unfold at the EPS court. But to us, the people have decided that they have given four more years to the president, President Nanadu Danko Akufuado, to further cement what he has started. 
and that will put Ghana in a very, very better position. And that is the cause we are. But I can only pray that we need consensus to forge ahead as a nation. Elections come, elections go, somebody must win, somebody must lose. The fact that you lost today doesn't prevent you to come tomorrow. You may come tomorrow and, be your, and it will be your day. So, and I hope my sister, being a politician, know all these things. So why are you uncomfortable with the uh, turn of events now? So let's be patriotic and let's have Ghana at heart. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Mujib. Uh, just to say that yes, Jennifer Rashida, okay. okay. She's watching us live on uh, Benya FM in um, Elmina in the central region. So we are live on Benya FM. So uh, you are asking about which radio station can watch us, listen to us uh, in the central region. Benya FM is one of them. Thank you, Jennifer. Kamala Ganya says, I don't know what to motivate any Ghanaian with conscience who is not criminal slave minded to follow and continue to support okay uh thank you uh for that message uh let me this one is from Ezina Kojo Joy, who says i bring you a quote from a book title quote how democracies die end quote uh by Stephen Levisky and Daniel Ziblatt who says this is how elected democ autocrats subvert democracy a packing and weaponizing the cost and other neutral agencies the buying of the media and the private sector are bullying them into silence and c rewriting the rules of politics to tilt the playing field against openness the tragic paradox of the electoral route to authoritarianism is that democracy's assassins use the very uh, institutions of democracy gradually subtly and even legally to kill it that's from Ezina Kojo Adjoe. thank you very much so uh, a bit of a confirmation so in the central region we are live on 105.7 in Elmina and reach 98.7 FM in Asimfoso. So, Benya, 105.7 FM Elmina and reach 98.7 FM in Asimfoso. A big thank you to those two stations. Prince Henry and Kofoedo says, from, For whatever happened on Thursday, I will blame the Dimensa led EC. If Dimensa had collected the Chimansa parliamentary results well, for everyone to know the truth, I don't think all that would have happened. The EC led by Dimensa should be ashamed and must be ready to answer any question on the floor of parliament when invited to do so. As for the military invasion, the person who ordered them should be ashamed and be ready to face the laws of the state. President Kufuado should also be ashamed that these incidents are happening under his leadership. My regards to Honorable Mago, you say, um, Julius Agahua and Tahiru Asawase says, and let me congratulate our MPs, most especially my hero, my MP Honorable Moon Mubarak. Some of us were scared, but our MPs were able to prove to us that they mean serious business and they have demonstrated their loyalty to the NDC and Mother Ghana. God bless them all. May every Carlos in their life that wants to steal their enjoy their joy meet his Muntaka and receive okay. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, this one is Romeno Getiate, who says good morning to you and your panel members. An excellent submission from Mago. I like her so much. You see, Tafai Nama here. I'm happy we have a speaker, but I'm also disappointed for the NDC leadership uh, allowing Joe Osewusu to be a first deputy speaker because of the comments he made about those innocent people they killed. Uh, the leadership of the NDC should have insisted that the MPP must nominate a different person, not the one who called our people whom uh, were deliberately killed criminals. Uh, Idion Gidi. Uh, Idi Gideon Montari says, Greetings to all. You are encouraged to speak truth to power now and forever. I congratulate the right honorable speaker, uh, Mr. Aban Sumanakin, for backbone of the eighth parliament elect. Uh, okay, this is the right Ghana must rise up to work more effectively and prudently to inure to the benefit of every citizen. We are solemnly, solemnly behind you and we expect nothing but the very best of your outfit. Ghana must work again, you say. Positive change in Medina uh, says you are an MPP youth and you are jubilating because injustice is being perpetrated in the system, all in the quest to make the mother serpent of corruption hold on to power. Don't forget that when the table turns, you are going to be the greatest victim and it can even be worse than what is happening now. Uh, you say, if I can tamale, this is a good morning. In fact, our democracy is, becoming, is coming to an end. The military invasion and the snatch of, snatching of ballots papers by MPP member of parliament Carlos Ahinkwa is totally unrealistic and unparliamentary 
the speaker must institute an independent investigation to bring the affected individuals to book. Uh, thank you uh, for that one. Uh, so those are some of the messages I'm going to be going through more as we go along. A big thank you to Salah Radio and Dabala also for picking us. And a big thank you to Ahunta 92.3 FM. Mr. Chumba for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and a happy new year. Oops. A happy new year to the august listeners of this program. Um, let me... I, I want to begin my um, I want to begin my submission with a passage from Acts of the Apostles, chapter sixteen, from verse twenty-five. It says that at about midnight, the walls of the prison shook, and the chains on Paul and Silas came loose. If you go on to read that passage, you will understand that Paul and Silas cast out a demon from a slave girl. And after they cast out a demon, they were declared heretics and put in prison. They, had, they didn't have any idea what to do. So they kept praying. They kept praying. And at midnight, an earthquake shook the walls of that prison and their chains came loose. When the history of this country is written in a time to come, as we add onto the contemporary history of this country, it will be said that at midnight on the 6th of January 2021, 137 gallant men and women of the NDC and three patriots from the new patriotic party delivered this country from tyranny without firing a single shot. They defied intimidation from the police. They defied intimidation from soldiers armed to the teeth. They defied intimidation from a thieving MP who stole ballots and ate the ballots before he was given a few punches to regurgitate the, the ballots he had eaten. They defied intimidation from a partisan clerk of parliament and his advisors who were running all around the place like green bottle flies on you know what, trying to change the outcome of the will of the Ghanaian people. But you know what? For those people who kept, and I'm one of them, so I'm speaking to me as well. Who kept moping and moping about how we had apparently lost election again? Uh, you see, if you don't believe in God, and I can't call myself the best Christian in the world, what happened in Parliament on the morning of June 7th you know. told all of us what the new patriotic party have been doing and who they are. So once again, if you notice, all the peace makes are quiet. The peace council is quiet. Catholic bishops conference, quiet. Presbyterian church, my own people. Howdy. Quiet. Methodist bishops conference, quiet. Catholic bishop all the conferences quiet it is not that they are so dumbfounded that they can't talk but they have been exposed where is the Ghana Bar Association why haven't they spoken 
juxtapose what happened. If it had been the NDC behaving like that and eating ballots, a parliamentarian stole ballots, ran into stole ballots and ate the ballots. Can you imagine what would have happened? But God being so good, and if you don't believe in God, just tell me to providence. We are at a point today where somehow or the other, somehow or the other, Abam Bagwin is now the speaker of the eighth parliament it is probably the most monumental incidence that has occurred in governance in this country ever since independence and and i and i and i'm unequivocal about that because you know why the auditor general that the consensus builders removed and locked his door is going to go back to work so we are going to audit the covid money that is too we are going to re-audit the coal money we are going to re-audit all the audits that have been discontinued and we'll add some new ones like the scam at the airport the scam the 150 dollar per passenger scam that is going into the pocket of frontier healthcare a company that was registered on june 17 2020 to scam travelers and take the money into offshore accounts for people who we don't know we will revisit pbs but even more importantly, even more importantly, the human rights abusers who were ministers in the last in the in, in the previous administration, the human rights abusers, the thieves, the pirates, the hijackers. All of them, the brigands, the buccaneers, all of them, if they have the unfortunate occurrence of being nominated as ministers, they will have to go and face a, a, an appointments committee which has a majority NDC um, composition. And many of them are going to have to account for their stewardship. And then there's the Electoral Commission. After calling the police on Harun Idrisu, now you are going to go and face Harun Idrisu for every penny. And so we are going to audit that one too. The money that you spent on that flawed election, that one too will be audited. So you see, NDC people, we couldn't have been in a better place. Because perhaps if President Mahama had acceded to the presidency precipitously on January 7, all these things won't come to light. My brother Mujib is talking about consensus builder. I'll cite you only one example that completely debunks what you are saying. If the current occupant, albeit temporarily of the presidency, was such a consensus builder, did you have a look at the brochure of the inauguration? Whose photo was there as speaker? That is consensus. 
consensus coming from where? They had already planned it. In their minds, it was already done. They had sequestered the NPP MPs in Alisa Hotel for three days to make sure that they browbeat them into selecting Professor Michael Quay. A man who all intents and purposes simply didn't even look healthy enough from videos we saw to occupy that position for another four years. We all saw the videos. But they had to impose him. Perhaps because they had a plan that only he could execute. Another arm of the tyrannical rule of the current occupant of the presidency. Notice that I'm not even mentioning his name. I would not even spell his name with capital letters. Because like the pres like the general secretary said, we do not recognize him as the president of this country. The electoral commission has declared him president. So president elect, so select whatever, so fine. But let me assure all my brothers and sisters in the NDC that the Ghanaian public have spoken. The MPP didn't win the election. And you have seen for yourself what they did in Techiman South. You have seen for yourself what they did in places like Zabzugu, um, Esika Duketa, um, uh, Sefiwi Osu, Takwan Shuaim. You have seen for yourself what they did. They have demonstrated it clearly. Whenever they see that the election is going not going their way, they resort to violence, steal the ballot box, do this, ballot stuffing. Oh, come on. Carlos the Jackal. Come on, Carlos Ainkra. Come on. You are better than that. You are better than that. And if you had any semblance of dignity left, you will resign that parliamentary seat because you are not fit enough to represent even a fly, let alone the good people of Tema West. And if you are listening to me, please save the little bit of dignity you have left and resign. That's it. So that a by-election can be held and a proper person who is fit to enter our chamber of parliament to represent the people of the West goes there to represent the people of the West. You were prompted by Osei Chaymen Sabuzu to go and steal ballots. Why didn't you ask him to go and do it himself? He's an expert at doing those things. In a period gone by, he had a history in St. Peter's. Ask him why he's not using his name, Lawrence Adai. Why didn't you ask him to go and do it himself? Ask him why he's called or said Jamie and and not Lawrence Adai. So why didn't you ask him to go and do it himself? And this one, Nobody can say anything. We have we saw him. We even saw him asking somebody who was in the way to get out of the way so that you go and steal the ballots and eat it. You ate the ballots, Carlos. Come on. You ate the ballots. You ate the paper. You may have been a clearing agent in the past, but that doesn't mean you should be eating paper. Come on, Carlos Ainkra. To those people who didn't have a clue, and I'm talking to the media as well, who have given the MPP a pass time and time and time again because of tribalism, because of misplaced elitism, because of a sense of whatever it is that they have in their brain, now you have seen it for yourself. And our history will never be the same. Our present will never be the same. 
Our future will never be the same. The present occupant of the presidency will not get away with appointing murderers. Excuse me to say, murderers, crazy people into the security services who order people to be shot and killed. Without any accountability. He will not appoint any more thieves, any more brigands, any more buccaneers, any more highway robbers to go and occupy the ministry so that they can steal unabridged and fettered. To my friends and colleagues, my brothers and sisters, the parliamentarians. I'm lost for words. Because you saved this country. You risked your lives. You braved the intimidation. You braved everything that was thrown at you. Even forcing a ballot eater to regurgitate the ballot like a snake that has swallowed a, a boiled egg. I have nothing but the thanks of the people of this country for your bravery. I have nothing but commendation for you because in the day to come, what you did will save many many people it will save little children from dying in the hospitals it will save many kayaye from being in the street it will make sure that our roads when the government says that a year it is a year of roads there will be actually a year of roads not a year of stealing road fund money and handing it to airhead party chairman to steal in a time to come when the government says they are going to build 118 hospitals they will be held to account to build those hospitals when COVID money comes they will not be allowed to steal it and distribute it to a party organizers to cook rice that doesn't have meat The bill came and it was 55 million cities. And, and for those of you who didn't hear what Mujib said, a typical MPP person, he said it doesn't change the name of the food. That it's, oh yes, all rice be rice. So that is their mentality. Mujib, keep quiet, keep quiet, please. Keep quiet. You see, my friends and, 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 and my brothers and sisters who are watching this program, many of you have desired a situation in this country where the executive was accountable to parliament. And many of us, myself included, thought that they would never come because of the way our voting system is in this country. But the people of Ghana have spoken. They are tired of the incongruence. They are tired of the theft. And this last four years has been an example of why we must go back to the drawing board and reconstitute our constitution to make sure that tyrants never rule this country again. So today, as we speak, you, the people of Ghana, who have had it in your power so to do, have done it. We should pat ourselves on the back that today, when a bill comes to parliament, it will not come at midnight. And by six o'clock in the morning, some people with the connivance of the clerk of parliament, who is an MPP party apparatchik, because we know his history when he was in Legon. 
to claim that it has been passed. Those who sat to pass the law, nobody knows. Then we have passed laws that have taken the heritage of the citizenry of this country, your children, my children, and handed it over to criminals. It won't happen again. At least not in the next contiguous four years. It won't happen again. And to the MPP, it couldn't have happened to a more deserving bunch of people. Your arrogance, arrogance, downright arrogance. The General Secretary of the MPP, my good friend John Buedu, my very good friend John Buedu, a man I have a lot of respect for before he became General Secretary of course. Saying that if we are not even careful, even the second deputy get for now. Who who zoomy who now? Who zoomy who now? The very person who said Ya Pom uh, uh, what's the name? Asamwa? Right? Is that his name? The MP for Formula. Ya Pomono. Ya Pomono. Now you are begging him to resign. Right? You are begging him to resign his seat and go back and contest the by election. So that he can become part of the MPP fold. And to that guy, I will say to him, Maza, if you allow them to convince you to go back and join them, these are the same people who told you that you don't belong. Eko Fuadu came to stand in your, in your village and said, On to me, when you because who more dear? Of your mommy, dear me, and any age, you ma. Oh, mommy, and any age, you ma. And you are going back. They are asking you to go back, and you are even thinking about it. You are thinking about it. You are going to resign your seat when your people have placed confidence in you that you are going to go to parliament and be an independent uh, um, mind for them and for the people of this country you want to resign your seat i have a i have a favorite song and some of the words are if you think you are lonely now wait until tonight if you go back to the mpp let's see how long you will last in the in their food Already they are saying you are the one who voted against them. And some of us know that it's probably not even you. It's probably not even you. I say probably. Could have been, couldn't have been. At least three of you voted. They didn't vote for them. At least three out of the 137. And if they hadn't sequestered them for three days in Alisa Hotel, it would have been more. Let me finish my submission. By quoting the words of an old Negro spiritual. Keep your eyes on the price. My friends and brothers in NDC. What we did wrong was staying in the wilderness too long. What we are doing right was the day we started to fight. We will fight these people in the daytime. We will fight them in the twilight. We will fight them at night. We will fight the heck we started fighting them at midnight. We will fight them in the dawn. We will fight them in the early hours. Tyranny and oppression will not persist in this country anymore. It won't happen anymore. We will not fire a shot. Whether the oppression is from the executive, from the judiciary, wherever it comes from, oppression and tyranny will not stand in this country anymore. We are tired. It doesn't matter how many people you kill. You can kill all of us. You can't kill everybody. You cannot kill everybody. 
We will not stand for it anymore. So gone are the days when the chief executive of this country will hire himself an aircraft at $17,000 an hour to go and watch Champions League. This year's Champions League or Bechet TV so. Like the rest of us. Or Bechet with DSTV so. Like the rest of us. There will be no more freebies. No more unaccounted. No more 1,500 uh, presidential staffers. No more free SUVs. P, 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 with blue and red lights. And causing traffic all over the place. Jumping everybody's car. P, 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 P. It won't happen again. You people are going to live like the rest of us. You are going to be disciplined like the rest of us. If you want to jump traffic, fix the roads. The one thing we did right was the day we started to fight. So we will keep our eyes on the price. And the price is to rescue this country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a couple of messages. If you just join us, the matter of all talk shows, Alagi and Alagi, live on Pan African Television. A couple of uh, messages, then I'll move to Mr. Pratt. Uh, this one is from Dennis Yakuti. Same thing very early. He said, apart from the despicable events of ballot paper smashing and storming of parliament by the military, at the time we did not have a commander in chief of the armed forces legally and left one in a doubt as to who could have given su any such orders. The victory secured with the election of Right Honorable uh, Alban S. K. Bakken is monumental enough to get all those nonsense in the four years ahead and also to ensure that deals like the Japan royalties and the likes in the original form are killed and buried. Indeed, if things remain as it is at the executive level, without even the NDC recovering its alleged one by stolen seats in parliament, we will see for the first time in history of the Fourth Republic a parliament that will truly work for Mother Ghana. Shalom. Uh, thank you uh, for that message. This one says, I am Ebenezer from Tema. Please help me. Uh, Nanadu and Baumia, President and Vice. I'm asking this question because the Constitution says Parliament shall continue, uh, uh, shall constitute at least 140 members. So, with Nana and Baumia sworn in before a number less than 140, does that constitute a quorum to describe that as Parliament? Thank you. He has thrown in a legal question. Uh, I, I don't think I'm qualified to uh, address that. Charles Namina, as I'm I see North MP took part in the voting. If a court doesn't understand, okay. They said they can also go to court. And to my fellow Akatama seniors, there's still high hopes because the Lord is on our side and NDC will laugh. Laugh last. Let's trust leadership. Uh, thank you for that message. Papa Bisio in Accra says, Hi, Sana. Is Anadu really a man that believes in the theory of working together with opposition? Just listen to him. I know Honorable Bagbin for a long time. He's a very good friend. And we can therefore work together for the interest of Ghana. That's a quote. He says, hypocrisy will really kill Nanado. Pa. Is he not the same man who, under his watch, closed down Radio Gold, XYZ, Munti FM, and many other radio and TV stations aligned to NDC? Didn't the leadership of NDC, which included your friend, Honorable Bagbin, appeal to you, Nanado, to reopen those media networks? Did you listen to him and others? Massa. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you very much for this year. And uh, the rest of the comments go to in Alexa Ita says, Sena, I watched the whole speaker election in the UK here. I could not believe my eyes. But as a practicing Christian, I can only say God has exposed the coup for those machinations. I am looking forward to the general of generals, Uncle Kwesi Price. Sena, why are they not talking about the disgraceful Oslausu? Elliot to Ogbe, let me end with you and then do. Uh, one that came from uh, coming in from uh, Ambassador Sampiali. <laughs> Elder says, Sena, greetings to my dear sister Mago. Imano Kwesi Bejra and all MPs who fought for good. First of all, I don't agree with the NDC accepting your wife's <coughs> Mr. Pratt, I'm having the record. Well, I think that any and everybody watching the Ghanaian political scene was expecting a lot of drama before the last two weeks. But we have had more than enough of drama over the last two weeks. There has been so much drama, 
so much drama that sometimes even the essence of what we are discussing is lost. Now, what are we discussing? All of this executive, judicial maneuvering, all of the hiccups in parliament and so on. What is it about? From my point of view, we are just talking about the will of the people. We are talking about the will of the people becoming the guiding post to executive action, to legislative action, and to judicial action. We are talking about how to realize the aspirations of our people. We are talking indeed about how to move our society forward in these circumstances, in the circumstances of COVID, in the circumstances of a world economic and social order which discriminates against the vast majority of our people. We are talking about the people's ability to survive. We are talking about the people's ability to live a fulfilling life. Indeed, we are talking about how our people can realize their full human potential in these circumstances. <laughs> this is the essence of all the maneuvering that is going on. And yet somehow, this essence is lost. This essence is lost in a highly polarized political atmosphere. This essence is lost in an atmosphere where everything is reduced to NDC versus NPP. And that is what makes me sad. You know, if you look at what has happened within the last two weeks, hmm, we are focused on all the dramatic things and forgotten a very, very important development in our history. Nobody cares. Nobody remembers that both sides of the House of Parliament have met to appropriate to themselves millions of Ghana cities a salary increase without considering the health of the national economy. Nobody even remembers that under some dubious arrangements, Article 71 office holders have allotted to themselves conditions of service which are outrageous in the light of the current economic and social conditions in Ghana. And that is my worry. Because we are not focusing on the essentials. We are focusing on drama. We are focusing on the things that make headlines. And we do know that the things which make headlines are absolutely sensational and most of the times are of very little significance to our people. So, now, in these two weeks of drama, what are some of the things which have happened in all of the drama which we should take note of? I cannot help but take note mm, of the last State of the Nation address presented by His Excellency Nanado Dankwa Akufuado to Parliament. And I take note of that because it is continuing on the same trajectory of public deceit. And I'm wondering when we will have leaders who will look us in the face and tell us the truth about the state of affairs of Ghana. The president went to parliament and told parliament that the national economic situation has improved significantly. And I'm sitting back and I'm saying, how could he have said that? How could he have looked us in the face, looked into the cameras and told us that the national economic situation has improved significantly. When we know 
that this country is not able to generate enough resources even to pay workers. Well, we know that about two-thirds of national revenue is expended on the payment of, 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 of debt and debt servicing. You live in a country with two-thirds of national revenue plus grants. Not just national revenue. National revenue plus grants. We spend it paying debts and interest. And you can look us in the face and tell us that the economy is doing very well. And I'm so shocked. And then we are told that we should look at the macroeconomic indicators. Look at the rate of inflation. Look at this and look at that. And all of us know that this economy has been rebased. And that if this economy had not been rebased, inflation would not be this low. When all of us know the facts. You know, Senna, I travel a lot because of the nature of my work and simply who I am. And my shock, eh? I was completely shocked when the president again looked into our face and said that under his administration, because of, 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 of planting food for jobs, and sometimes planting for food and jobs, and sometimes I wonder what you can plant food for. Food has always throughout the ages been planted for food, uh, 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 <laughs> for jobs and for food. And we are being told that there's something wonderful called planting for food and jobs. Something new. What is new about that? But we are told that the excess has been so successful that we no longer import basic foodstuffs. Fortunately for us on this panel, we have Bajib, who comes from the Upper West region, and he has recently been to his home constituency. Let him tell us honestly that he didn't see truckloads of tomatoes coming from Burkina Faso. Everybody who lives in this country can still see the truckloads of tomatoes coming from Burkina Faso. How can you see? How can you see? The people of Tamale know. The people of Tamale know. These frog roads pass through Tamale. They can see them feely, feely, gani, gani. But the president doesn't see it. When he was going on his campaign, he didn't meet all these trucks coming from Burkina Faso with all kinds of foodstuffs. He didn't see it. Maybe it's not his fault. Maybe it's not his fault. Maybe the taint on the windows of the cars in which he drove for his campaign were so dark that he couldn't see outside. Maybe he was so fast asleep on his campaign to the north that he didn't need these trucks, bringing in foodstuffs. But that's what our president is telling us. The reality is so far away from what sometimes our leaders see. And it is completely shocking, you understand? Completely shocking. Then we are told of free SHS and other stories and so on. This election results, huh? even if we accept the results as has been declared by the Electoral Commission, should be a signal to those in power that their dreams are different from the dreams of ordinary people in this country. Why? They assumed that this phantom of one district, one factory, phantom of one village, one dam, and all the other phantoms put together will secure for them a huge victory in the elections. 
it did not happen. And this is why they should begin to stop and think. But the president's speech shows that they are not stopping and perhaps they are not thinking too. And this is a huge problem. You understand? Huge problem. So unrealistic. But you see, then we come back to the dissolution of the seventh parliament. And the ushering in of the eighth parliament. And that also gives us very important lessons. It is clear, very clear, that the National Democratic Congress uh, was tactically far more superior than the New Patriotic Party. Tactically, far more superior than the New Patriotic Party. Now, why do I say this? First and foremost, hmm? the New Patriotic Party, and it is clear with evidence and very clear, that it sought to engineer a majority in the House eh, by using judicial and executive maneuvers. But he didn't even do his calculations well. So court order here, court injunction here, and some of them were contradictory. If you look at the judgment given by the high court sitting in Techiman, hmm, in the Techiman South dispute, and you look at the high court sitting in Cape Coast over the uh, 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 Asin, 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 Asin North dispute and so on, the, the, the interpretation of the law is so different, it's unbelievable. Please. You actually have one high court saying that at all times the people must be represented in parliament. And then you have another high court saying that the people need not be represented in parliament at all times. And it's the same high court. Of course, we do know that judges determine cases hmm, on the basis of their own orientation, on the basis of their own social background, and so on. We do know that. And that it is not unusual for two judges hmm, at the same level of the judicial hierarchy to make different interpretations of the law. It is, it is not unusual. We even know that Supreme Court judges sometimes differ on the interpretation of the law. We know that as a fact. You understand? And it is not unusual. That is why at the level of the Supreme Court, sometimes you can have as many as 11 and 15 judges sitting on one case. And at the end, they have to vote to determine which part we should take. So it is not unusual that you have two judges at the same level who disagree. But it is strange when all these disagreements appear to be calculated to achieve one end. And that one end is to secure for the new patriotic party a majority in parliament over a short period of time. That's raised suspicions. You understand? We have to understand that justice is something which must not always be done, but must be seen to be done. We need to understand that the people who sit on the bench, sit on the bench with the authority of the majority of all of us, eh? and therefore when they act, we ought to understand what they are doing and we ought to accept that indeed they are acting on our behalf, and so on. All the judgments are given in the name of the people. The judiciary expresses the, the, the sovereignty of, of Ghana. The judiciary is supposed to express the will of the people of Ghana. Where judicial decisions are in, con in conflict, with the expressed will of the people of Ghana, then we have a problem 
which needs to be rectified and so on. You understand? Now, I cannot understand in these circumstances how anybody hmm, looking at the interest of Ghana, looking at Parliament's oversight responsibility over the executive, looking at Parliament's legislative powers and so on, could have, in all sincerity, nominated the Right Honorable Mike Aaron Okwey for re-election as Speaker. I can't believe it. A tactical blunder? Because at least we do know that he's had some running difficulties with some members of parliament who belong to his own political party. That alone should have raised the red flags. You understand? Knowing also that the constitution insists on secret ballot, secret balloting for the election of a speaker, that should have been a sign. But being that as it may, who doesn't know that the physical condition of, of the Right Honorable Reverend Professor Mike Aaron Okwey, his physical condition, is a challenge for the job of speaker? Just before his nomination, somebody did release a video of him. And when I saw the video, I said, my goodness. Why do this to this gentleman? This is a man who has served as a lecturer in the political science department of the University of Ghana, has a record there. Whatever that record means, I don't want to get into it. But he has a record there. This is a man who has become a member of parliament, a minister. A diplomat serving at ambassadorial level, speaker of parliament and so on. He has clocked the age of 76. He has physical difficulties and so on. At least show him a little respect by allowing him to go home and rest. This is the guy who was pushed into the frail for this contest. Are you surprised that you couldn't win the, the election as speaker? Who is surprised? I am not. Because if I were a member of the new patriotic party and I was in parliament, I wouldn't vote for him. You understand? I wouldn't vote for him. All of us do, do know that the speaker of parliament, and indeed that's been demonstrated throughout the Fourth Republic, ought to exhibit some level of neutrality and so on. This speaker was so partisan, it was unbelievable. So partisan that sometimes his own people crunch from his partisanship, and so on. And yet, this is the person who was put forward as speaker. In fact, I'm surprised. Really surprised by he he, that he lost by that small margin. Because from all the things that I was hearing and, and, and following and so on, the expectation was that he was going to lose by as much as 10 votes. As much as 10 votes. You understand? Maybe the, the, the camping which was done at Alisa Hotel and all the other things which were done may have reduced his margin of defeat. But his margin of defeat was expected to be much bigger than this one. You understand? Why do you think that throughout this, this process, the National Democratic Congress insisted on secret balloting? Because they had done their calculation. Because they had done their homework. Because tactically, they were superior. Because they knew that if it went into secret balloting, some people would descend. Some people would defect. 
And indeed, secret balloting brought out these results. Indeed, there was a struggle over whether or not to have secret balloting or not for well over three hours. Why? Because they were tactically superior. They had read the game. They knew what would happen if there was secret balloting. And more importantly, they were insisting on a constitutional provision. The constitution is clear that the election of a speaker ought to be done by secret balloting. So all these MPP elements were saying that because of the whip system, there ought not to be secret balloting. And that when their MPs vote, they have to go and show it to their leaders and so on. What do they understand by secret balloting? What did they understand by secret balloting? How can you have secret balloting when after voting, you have to go and show it to others for confirmation? How can that be secret balloting? That attitude was a glaring affront to the Constitution. That insistence on showing ballots publicly and so on was a subversion of the 1992 Constitution. And there can be no other interpretation. You understand? Then, my brother, technology today has helped us a lot. Advanced technology has made us aware that some of the allegations which were made with regards to the December 7th elections were not frivolous. And that indeed, they, they had grounds and so on. What allegation was made in the December 7th election, which has not been proven today? One, show me one. Attempts at ballot stuffing. Clear. Snatching of ballots, clear. Manipulation of judicial and executive, uh, 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 you know, maneuvering, judicial and executive maneuvering, clear. The abuse of the security forces, clear. You understand? The, the, the lack of transparency in, in, in the coalition, clear. All these allegations became manifest in parliament. Before our very eyes, a lot of people are claiming that some of the MPs on the NDC side actually moved ballot boxes and so on. Yes, they did. But go and watch the videos. I wish we could show some of those videos. Go and watch the videos and see what led to that. Everybody saw a gentleman in black suit attempting to remove ballot papers from his pocket to stop the ballot box. We saw it. Now, if you see this, what are you supposed to do? Allow the process to continue? When you see ballot boxes being stopped, what do you, what, what, what do you, what, how? I don't have the right to allow the rigging to take place and go to court. I mean, incredible. You understand? So we saw all of this. The worst of it was to see a member of parliament, member of parliament, Honorable member of parliament and somebody who was an appointed deputy minister at that level, snatching ballot papers and attempting to run out of the house with them. Now, if people at the level of members of parliament and ministers can become ballot snatchers, then what about members of the Bogatanga Bulldogs and, and, and whole scorpions 
and so on. What would they do? What will they do if leaders at the level of members of parliament and former ministers are snatching ballot papers? What will the others do? I am so deeply embarrassed by these developments in parliament. Exceedingly deeply embarrassed by these developments in parliament. But you see, the tactical superiority of the NDC was also demonstrated in another way. Under normal circumstances, hmm, the Speaker of Parliament is proposed by the majority. And in most cases, the majority wins the Speaker of Parliament. Okay? The first Deputy Speaker is also proposed by the majority. And they usually, almost usually, always win that position. And then the second deputy speaker is normally proposed by the minority and it is accepted. Have you realized that something drastically has changed? Now, only the speaker of parliament was proposed by the majority and was accepted. The first deputy speaker eh, is from the MPP. And the second deputy speaker is the independent candidate who had publicly declared that he will be voting along with the MPP. Do you see the tactical maneuver? Do you see the superior tactical maneuver? Do you see it? So by this arrangement, what has happened huh, is that if there is a crucial vote in parliament, no, if there's a crucial vote in parliament and urban Bagman is not available to chair proceedings and so on, first deputy speaker, Do Ose Wusu, becomes speaker. The moment he becomes speaker, he has lost his vote. I mean, do you see the superior tactical maneuver? Right now, as things stand, huh? MPP has 137 seats in parliament. NDC has 137 seats in parliament. Because of this tactical maneuver, at any time that there's a crucial issue to be voted upon, if Alban Bagwin is not available, MPP has 136. NDC has 137. Superior technical, uh, tactical maneuver. Now, you have an independent uh, member of parliament. By accepting the position of a second deputy speaker, even the sitting arrangement has changed. He can no longer sit with NDC and can no longer sit with MPP. You understand? So, another tactical maneuver. Anytime Joe Osewusu is not around and Abandonment is not around, the independent candidate is sitting in the chair. He can't vote with the MPP. So this is the superiority <laughs> in tactics. MPP couldn't see this. They went along with it. They signed their own death warrant. They couldn't think deep enough. They have been tactically outmaneuvered. Tactically, completely outmaneuvered. But you see, it doesn't even end here. All of these injunctions and so on, and the judicial maneuver and so on, has to come to an end at some point. You understand? What would happen to Techiman South? Hmm? What would happen to Esikado? What will happen to about six seats which are currently in dispute? It is just possible that at the end of the day, the NDC may even have more than 141 seats in parliament. So the NDC's majority in parliament is something which is possible. And I'm choosing my words very carefully. Possible. Now, if that should happen, what would that mean? That is assuming that the Supreme Court decision 
it's not for a rerun of the elections. Assuming that the Supreme Court decides that Mr. President has been properly elected and can continue, he can't get a thing done. He can't get a thing done. The NDC is in a position today at least to frustrate the appointment of ministers and all other public servants who the constitution requires ought to go to parliamentary vetting. Indeed, we have come to the point where ministers appointed by the president can be thrown out. And so, where does that leave the executive? The budget, the budget, which is an estimate of revenue and expenditure for the year, can be thrown out. Where does that leave the government? How do you run the country? So, they have presented themselves with an impossibility. Clear impossibility. I mean, running government between now and 2024 is a huge Herculean tax. Now, if you come to appreciate uh, that even when they had a majority which ran into 60 and so on, they couldn't manage the affairs of this country properly, then what happens now? I'm just beginning to wonder what the future holds for us. And I'm beginning to wonder what the future holds for us because the reality is frightening. Master, the reality today is totally and completely frightening. What can you do in any part of the world today without reliable, regular supply of electricity? You can't run your health service without reliable supply of electricity. You can't run education without reliable supply of electricity. You can't run your agriculture without reliable supply of electricity. You can't do anything without reliable supply of electricity. And we all know today that a crisis is looming and that if care is not taken in the next couple of weeks and couple of months, electricity supply will grind to a halt. We know that. We know that as of October or September, Ghana was indebted to independent power producers to the tune of $1.7 billion. That's how much we owed independent power producers. $1.7 billion US dollars. Before the elections, independent power producers were threatening to shut down their plants. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with that in this complex, paralyzing situation for government. How do you deal with that? All of us know that our debt levels today are unsustainable. The debt levels are unsustainable. So the option of borrowing hmm, to regularize the supply of electricity doesn't exist. And we're not just talking about independent power producers. There is no company in the electricity chain which is not heavily indebted. The last time I checked, the Volta River Authority alone was indebted to the tune of over $400 million. How do we pay? This is the reality. This is the reality we are confronted with today. Look, I have no doubt and mark my words, I have no doubt that within the next one, two, three to four months, we are going to be compelled to raise petroleum prices with very dire consequences for the transport industry, with very dire consequences for industrial production, with dire consequences for agricultural production, with dire consequences for everything. Beyond petroleum prices, I can predict with certainty that prices for all utilities, tariffs for all utilities are going to go up. 
How do you manage this situation? Are we going to continue to manage this situation with sloganeering? Are we going to tell the people when petroleum prices go up that inflation is stable? Who is going to take that? When we cannot put on the lights, are you going to tell them about macroeconomic stability? What do you take the people for? Are you going to tell the people of Ghana today, again, our free SHS? When they can't move, when they can't sell, market women can't sell, when prices are shooting up through the roofs and so on, what are you going to tell the people of Ghana? So this is the gloomy, gloomy, gloomy situation in which all of us find ourselves. And this is the time for our leaders to begin to think outside the box. To think outside the box. To use language. Hmm? Language, policy, and actions which unite all of us in the search for solutions to the problems of this country. This winner takes it all. This attitude, you know, which we have seen over the years and so on, cannot lead us to the path to stability and progress. It is not possible. Things have to change. And unfortunately, I am not seeing those changes. The arrogance is still there. The arrogance is still there. I mean, I watch events in Parliament uh, from midnight to the dawn of 7th January. And I felt sad for this country. I felt sad for this country when the MPP leader in Parliament opened his mouth and referred to his opponents as, 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 as a gang of rabble rousers. I was ashamed. How do you achieve consensus with this language? How do we unite to resolve the concrete, frightening problems of this country with this kind of attitude and language? I just wondered. But you see, in all of this, it is important for us to pinch ourselves to remember that there is still a petition before the Supreme Court which has not been decided. At least at the level of theory, at least at the level of theory, that petition can be decided either way. So it is possible for the Supreme Court to come to the conclusion that His Excellency Nana Adudankwa Akufu Adu has been properly elected and that he should continue to be president of Ghana. Now, even if the Supreme Court came to this decision, look at the problems I've mentioned, the difficulties and so on. It's an impossible task for him. You understand? But let us assume that the Supreme Court is also quite capable of coming up with a decision that his election was not proper. And that his election infringed on the provisions of the Constitution and so on, and therefore there should be a rerun of the election. Let us not forget that this is a possibility. Now, if this is a possibility, given what has happened in Parliament, given what is happening in our society, given all the self-denial and so on that politicians are engaged in and so on, what would be the outcome? And how would that outcome affect the crucial, uh, the crucial responsibility to build Ghana in such a way that we can banish hunger, inequality, ignorance, and disease? How is that possible? So, look, let's stop misbehaving. Those of us who have gone to school small uh, and have the privilege of sitting on television sets like this, we should stop misbehaving. We should stop 
thinking that the whole world operates under our feet. I begin to face reality. Begin to see our problem for what it is. Begin to realize that although we claim to be one of the largest producers of gold in the world, we get next to nothing from gold production in our country. So what do we do to maximize what we get from gold? So that we can build roads, improve infrastructure. So that we can improve education, the quality of education. So that we can improve the quality of healthcare and so on. What do we do in order for us to achieve these objectives? We should stop deceiving ourselves. We should stop being Don Quixote and see our problems for what they are. You know, I've heard some commentators, and indeed the first commentator I heard who said this was Kodo Opon Nkrumah, the Minister for Information. And what did they say? Well, former minister, I agree with you. But what did they say? That the people of Ghana took a decision. That they want MPP and NDC to work together. That's rubbish. Who took that decision? It's not true. <laughs> there are people who were voting for MPP. Listen to me very carefully. The people who were voting for MPP were voting for MPP to win. They were not voting for MPP to go into partnership with NDC. That was not the objective. Can I finish? Can I finish? The people who were voting for NDC were not voting for NDC to go into any collaboration. They meant, they meant that they wanted NDC to win. So that foolish concoction of the people of Ghana wanting the two parties to work together, where is it coming from? Where is the basis? Who told them that? Who went to the ballot box and put one vote for NDC and put one vote for NDC and said, go and work together? Everybody had one vote. And every and anybody who voted wanted their preferred choice to win. We are in this state because we know what happened. We are in this state because everybody knows what happened. I don't even have to repeat it. What happened in Parliament with the election of the Speaker also happened in the parliamentary elections and happened in the presidential elections. That is why we are here. You understand? So this, 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 what is it? This figment, figment in some people's heads that the people of Ghana wanted the two sides to work together. Who, who did you ask? Who told you that they wanted the people of Ghana to work together? We are faced with a concrete reality. <laughs> and the concrete reality is that today, mm -hmm. no matter what happened in the past, our reality today is that NDC has 137 seats in parliament. And MPP has 137 seats in parliament. Today, we can no longer be talking about parliament in the terms that we used to, majority versus minority, because there's no minority and there's no majority. That's the reality we have to work with. I can accept that. I can understand that. This is the reality we have to work with. And in working with this reality, it calls for statesmanship on the part of all of our leaders. It calls for shedding arrogant attitudes. It calls for shedding incipient fascist tendencies. Look, me, I've been in this country for some time. I'm not a very young boy, you understand? I'm not a very young boy. I've been through many things and so on. I've seen many elections. I've seen many governments. And I can beat my chest today 
that at least uh, from 1980 to today, this is the first time any government is burning demonstrations. And I'm fighting, I'm worried. All the sacrifices that were made, all the struggles that were waged to build a democratic order, uh, appears to be in vain. And the erosion of democratic rights is frightening. And nobody should sit back and allow this trend to continue. It is time for all the people of Ghana to act courageously and decisively to halt the slide back to the era of dictatorship. I'm frightened. This week, something happened. You all heard about Xylophone FM, where somebody wearing an Azugu Max raided the station and threatened to kill Black Rasta and, 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 and the production team, leading to the shutdown of the radio station. I've never heard this before. It has never happened before. But a marksman walks into a radio station and attempts to, to shut it down, to kill a presenter. Never heard it before. Look at the threats that journalists are being subjected to. Manasseh Azure and so on. Being threatened with death. Today, you take your phone and then you get calls. And it's happening to many people. And people on the other side are threatening to kill you and so on. This is a development we must not encourage. We must stand up and resist this. Because this would not lead to democracy. This will lead to mayhem. And you see, it gets worse. It gets worse when leading members of government, or the governing party at least, can sit on television with national outrage and call on their supporters to kill their opponents. Are you not worried? Are you not frightened? I am. Well, indeed, uh, leading members of the governing party can actually sit on television and say to a former president, not any other person, former president, that we will burn your house. We will burn you alive. Who will burn you to ashes. Is this not frightening? Is this not worrying? How do you build a democracy this way? Are you not worried when leading members of the governing party can actually sit on television and tell a former head of national security that we know your house. We are going to burn your house down. And that, from where I'm standing, even if I use a catapult, I will reach your house. Is that not worrying for those who want to build democracy? It's even more worrying when you come to appreciate the fact huh, that there cannot be a democracy if the principle of the equality of citizens is not upheld. One of the basic, basic principles of democracy is the equality of citizens. So when you have people who sit publicly and so on and make these claims, make these threats and so on, and nothing happens to them, absolutely nothing happens to them, and you have a situation where Inu Safuseni, sitting member of parliament, comes onto Alaji and Alaji and says that I believe that Nana Kufado lost the elections. And to that extent, I'm ready, or I'm offering an advice to former President John Muhammad to form a cabinet, and he's invited to the police. Can you imagine? Inu Safuseni is invited to the police CID headquarters for investigations. Those who have not denied, who publicly are calling for death and arson and so on, they are free. Are you not worried about this situation? Is this democracy? Even in banana republics, these things don't happen this way. You understand? Even Haiti and the Papa Doc and Baby Doc, 
why they established the Tonton Makuts and so on, these things didn't happen. Why are we allowing it to happen now? Are we saying that the president has not heard these threats? Are we saying that the Inspector General of Police has not heard these threats? Are we saying that our security services are not aware of these threats and so on? Hey, what is happening? My friends, what is happening? I am very deeply worried, you know, about these developments. Very, very deeply worried about these developments. Because these can collapse a democratic experiment. These can usher us into a new era of chaos and mayhem. Look, I've said repeatedly, I saw with my own eyes what happened after June 4, 1979. You understand? Maybe younger persons can afford to wish for madness. I cannot afford to wish for madness. Because I saw elderly women, women old enough to be my aunties and grandmothers, stripped completely naked, whipped in their private parts, and paraded on the streets. I saw it with my own naked eyes. I counted along with others. 246 people disappeared in our country in a matter of one year. I saw the egregious violation of human rights and so on. And I don't want to return to that era. But I cannot prevent it. If our political leaders continue to misbehave, if our political leaders continue to call for arson and murder, how can I stop what I will try to contribute, but my contribution will pale into insignificance. You understand? If you live in a country in which Politicians can single out some ethnic groups and call for their elimination. Politicians can say, if you see a guy, if you see an every man, hit him on the head with a crow, uh, with, 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 with a, a crowbar. And nothing happens to them. How can we prevent the situation of 1979? Who am I? What can I use to prevent the situation of 1979? I don't want to go back to that situation. But I'm helpless. And so many people are helpless because of the recklessness, absolute recklessness of the current political leadership. It is frightening. Massa, it is absolutely frightening. Look, I get a call. You know, I get a call. Early in the morning, and the guy who is speaking claims to be a lecturer in a university. And he says, anytime I see you on television, I'm reminded of the devil incarnate. And that people like you should not live. If you don't eliminate people like you, this country cannot survive. And so on. And, and it's, it's from a lecturer. Lecturer in a university. I mean, before, if you heard that somebody had a doctorate, you held him in awe. If you heard that somebody was teaching in the university, I mean, my goodness, it was the ultimate in wisdom and so on. Even they, some of them, are making such calls. Then I put his name out. And somebody, one of our listeners, called him. And he said, oh, I'm going to kill you too. He said, I'm going to kill you too. And that people who don't see that the Akufuado government is doing well are enemies of the country. They are unpatriotic and they have to be killed. I'm sure that that listener is still listening to us. He called me and gave me this information. He will probably confirm by, by text message or something. Are you not frightened? But you have now come to the stage where if you disagree with Nanado Dankwa Akufuado, 
It's a death sentence. What country are we building? It's not God for goodness sake. I have known Nana Kufuado. I've worked with him. I've eaten with him. I've organized with him. He is like any other human being. So how come that if you disagree with him, you have to be killed? Please, let all these people understand one thing. They should understand very clearly one thing. That look, there is no force bigger than the force of the masses. There is no force more potent than the force of the masses. And they should never forget that the people of Ghana have never been cowards. We have risen in the face of adversity. We have risen in the face of aggression. And we have always been victorious. They should learn about the story of Yasantua, who stood up for the Ashanti Empire against the British Empire. She was not a coward. And our women are not cowards. They should learn from our history how ordinary people stood up against colonialism and defeated colonialism. They should learn that the killing of Sergeant Adjeti and Corporal Udate and so on did not stop the independence movement. In fact, they should not even go too far in our history. They should remember May 11, 1995. The Kumitrako killings, when did it stop? In spite of the May 11, 1995 incidents, Nana Kufuado has become president. Whether you like his presidency or not is another matter, but he has become president. You understand? Threats of death, threats of injury, threats of aggression would not stop the people's movement for freedom. It will not stop the people's movement, which insists that sovereignty resides in the people, and that ultimately only the people will make the decisions about their future and their present. Let them wake up and think again. This country can't be saved. It will be rescued. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Pat. Uh, okay. Quite a sobering one. With regards to the threats on the lives of certain N NDC officials, including ex-president Mahama, that they were going to burn his house, and we all know who said that, a report was made, a criminal complaint was made to the police. I am aware that a criminal complaint was made. Up to today, nothing. This same person threatened Sami Jemfi live on TV. A criminal complaint was made. Nothing. So, like the Americans say, it is what it is. But let's just remember that violence and errant behavior is completely reciprocal. Matches. It's not an essential commodity. Neither is petrol. Or any incendiary for that matter. Everybody can buy some. So some people get up and they just get up and they threaten and they threaten and threaten. And yet, when the crap hits the fan, they are the first people to run away. When the fist started flying in parliament, those people who threaten people in, radio, uh, in TV studios, what were they doing? Were they seeing tourism of the face? Okay. Well, say this, and Senator Lanka Kwesi, that in the last one, with four prices increased two times. Check, girl. Uh, he says, um, Gabriela Tete also says, four prices have gone up twice between 7 December and 7 January. So, uh, something that a lot of them are drawing attention to. Uh, Mohamed Mutala, assembly member for Agri, is it Muhiyabihi in Tamale, says, please let me happily first extend my New Year greetings to my hardworking uh, Madam Margaret for a wonderful submission. I'm proud of her. 
which is here in the house as a member of parliament come tonight the ninth parliament in the next four years to come no. but as exposed no. mpp no. and Nanado for the whole world to see the evil and wicked behavior in the country do i hear mp people calling for working together whether hypocrisy darkness and light can never match so mpp's life cannot match with ndc that wants to take Ghana, uh, Ghana to the land of happiness you say um this one is on deep cool ishmael who's the adult traffic license and Nanado and mpp has the power military police vni judicial etc but the power of ndc god is supreme Nanado, uh, he said is the worst ever president since independence and i thought all the SHS students chew papers during exams, not knowing the master chua was in parliament. Dishonorable Carlos Ainqua must be jailed like the Senate West corporate. Congress to right honorable Bagbin and NDC MPs and members. I salute uh, Bunaz, NDC Heavyweight Regional Chairman. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, David Sena is saying, I'm very excited to be a Ghanaian today, going by what happened on January 7th. We are proud of our NDC MPs and the Patriots in the MPP for saving Ghana and our democracy, by the way. That entrusting the lives of right honorable speaker Alban Sumana Bagbin on NDC MPs into the hands of the interim president and his executive. You'll be held responsible if anything and to what happens to any of them. They say Ghana is up and rising again. So we'll just do uh, just a, a quick round. Uh, I have yeah. less than 20 minutes. So, Margo. Sena, uh, before I, I, I say anything, I want to congratulate Her Excellency, the former First Lady. Uh, Madame Lodina Mahama with her yearly, with the Lodina Mahama Foundation yearly celebrates Christmas with the orphanage, the witches camp, and the vulnerables. She's done it again and as her motto goes, said the more you share, the more you also receive. May God replenish whatever she's lost. Since she's a giver, I know God will continue to give her. So now on the election petition, I won't say much because it's, it's in court and uh, I know hearing will start very soon. But I think we should pray for His Excellency John Ramani Mahama. He's been a good man. I grew up to meet democracy. From what Uncle Chrissy just said, with coups and mayhems and other things. At least our parents also told us a little. Where you saw kids being raped, like children. I have a nine-year-old girl. So when you hear such things, where babies are taken from their mothers, their heads smashed, so the war died. The power was in the gun. With the glaring theory in this 2020 election, this is my election, I can say none other than to say God bless His Excellency John Ramani Mahan for taking the right channel to address his concerns. I pray God in his wisdom will give the judges the discernment to see what is right and do what is right. I urge all NDC members and all well wishes, all Ghanaians, let's pray and wish for the truth and let democracy stand for this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also understand we are live on Hope TV and Radio on Facebook. And this one uh, says, good morning, Senna. Happy New Year to Mago. She looks fantastic. Could you think well for an uncle Chrissy Pata doing well in, in their delivery? Those regards to the team, at least we have a president who can even carry the presidential sword because he weighs on him. Right? <laughs> so, very interesting comments. <laughs> yeah, Senna, I think it has been a great show this morning, but... Uh, and, and 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 just to 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 side with uncle kosuprite on the hap what happened in parliament it isn't that to some extent we don't know what was going to happen but at a point you also need to be strategic but it all has to do with what i said earlier about the numbers so now if you look at 137 137 so both parties were confident that even if it goes into the election and you don't even get 
we were hopeful that we will get the independent. And so now when the ballot was counted, you saw how it happens. It means that even within the new patriotic party, some people, MPs, descended. And the, uh, Chairman, how are you sure that some NDC people too didn't vote for for okay? Chama, but that is it. But I, but you can't be sure. Exactly, exactly, exactly. But Chama, I think that. But at end. But we also, Chama, we also what happened, and I did see that what was happening have effect on the immigration and swearing in of the president. So and here is the case: the Opo NDC caucus was not ready to even cooperate in the house at all. On every stage, they were very look at their position, and they went with a uh, one mind that to take the, the, the speaker of parliament. And we felt that <laughs> we needed to, 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 to do something and get the whole process of transition complete. So, chairman, but at least when you are in a difficult certain situation, you can't prevent it. Well, the number issue, but as you indicated, I think all the processes have been completed. Now it is left with going to court the, to battle some of the disputed parliamentary elections. NDC is going to court. We are also going to court we to battle. Court. So let's le let's see how it all and it all ends. But chairman, you from where you are coming from, I'm touched with this your last submission mm -hmm. about what is going on in this country. But I think that uh, I don't want to associate or label one governance or one political system about it. It has just it has been there with us for a period of time under this fourth republic. And Chama, if people in society and people refuse to speak against some of these excesses, it will get to a point like we will be talking about what Chama is talking. If you allowed political parties to have a different militia groups, in society seems unconcerned. If you I sit down and allow these parties to resource and arm this group of people aside the traditional system, security system, and society seems to see anything wrong with this things, come on, these are some of the consequences we'll be going through. I hope you are getting the argument. So, me, the earlier we all begin to talk and condemn those things, the better. Especially, we were young, but thank God, education, we read history and we saw how where this country was in some of this coup d'etat period, how people lost their life, how mothers, women were stripped naked and were treated in this country. Some lost their fortune, and as a result of that, they lost their life, and the whole entire family is now living in abject poverty. Even young as we are, but we never pray to get there. But you close your eyes when it comes to some of this security reason security issues. Whether you are MPP, you are NDC, you are PNC, you never know when it happened. And when the trouble starts, the bullet doesn't know who belongs to Umbrella or who belongs to Elephant. Mm. Chama, how can people just threaten or do whatever they want to like, uh, like and go with impunity? It's not, it's not, it doesn't occur in a well-civilized society like what we are trying to build. And it must be condemned by all. Chama, some also, if Fortunately, unfortunately, those who lost their life as a result of the Tachima Sahab shooting, but they are, even if we want to investigate more, some might even be sympathizers or supporters of various political parties, not only one particular party. So we, it doesn't have to let go. It has to be investigated, and those behind it should be brought to book. The law must work. We crafted the laws. And when any time the law wants to argue, you see people trying to bring religion and cultures aspect into it. That is why we are still where we are. Take places like America. My brother, my in-law, brother-in-law, but when the law is cracking, let the law crack. I think that is my position. And if we begin to go on that direction, I think we'll have a very civilized society. But with the issue of trade to journalists, trade to other senior members in society, it doesn't start now. But it is no good, but because we all fail right from that time to condemn it and confront it squarely and make sure the systems work, the institutions work. Chairman, but I will be, so, I will be sorry and disappointed if legally, eh, truly, the police was petitioned on those comments and up to now nothing has done, then, uh, 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 um, then we are in trouble. Okay. We are in trouble. Okay.
Kofi changed them and says, did I hear Mujib say in 2012 when another lost the election, there wasn't any violence? There wasn't them. any violence. Okay. There, there was, was what, as compared to what is happening now. Ah, there was no violence. Now the demonstration is no violence. Brendan Marquez and all those in Shaba. Who burned Marquez in 2012? Who burned Marquez in 2012? We are finished this happening. We are now assembled at the end of the world. You are a victim of that. Seven MPs present. Kindly read Article yeah. 102 of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. Oh, they need just one third of the entire membership of Parliament to form a quorum. Uh, Mark Titi Benson said, uh, NDC Professional Forum. Uh, send that. Thank you. Uh, Fangoka is also saying, Sena kudos to Mr. Kujukun for his excellent boot for boot submission. Until I woke up to his family, <laughs> it appeared that most NDC leaders were losing focus <laughs> on the elephant. Um, how could you? <laughs> Najib, um, a certain CNN anchor said something the other day, which I thought was a it was a beautiful one of the most beautiful um, admonitions I've ever heard. He said, "Don't smoke your own supply. It's not a good business model." Najib, I could have mistaken you for somebody who has been uh, in hibernation or asleep until this morning. You are telling me that you don't know that there's a certain MP in this country who sits on TV and threatens and insults, not just insults, threatens to kill people. No, I didn't say in the past. It was made a few weeks ago. It was made a few weeks ago. And let me quote him. Let him talk about him with your homes. If you oh, yeah, yes, you say your man command, your best shoe, you feel only now. President Mahama has been an S W commander in chief of the Ghana Armed Forces. You think he can't give command? You think you know? You people should thank God, eh? That certain people, certain people like John Mahama have ruled this country and they have the kind of spirit that they have. Because if John Mahama was like the current temporary occupant of the presidency, and that is what has happened in various countries in this West Africa sub-region. We have two all die dies in their uh, country and everybody dies. Right? Happened in Sierra Leone, happened in Cote d'Ivoire, happened in, you know, the Cote d'Ivoire case is very interesting. A man who forced a, foisted a civil war on the people of Cote d'Ivoire because somebody wanted an extended term. How many people died in that war? In the end, it took the Western countries to join the civil war on his side and bring him to power. After his two successive terms ended, he changes the constitution so that he can have a third term. And this is a man who, to all intents and purposes, is in advanced state of prostate cancer. According to the same Western government. This, this is shocking. But in our contiguous history, in West Africa, people like this litter and stain our history. But there is also the history of Burkina Faso, where Bess Kampari was probably the most armed president in this sub-region the people one day had had enough of him they marched to his palace without firing a single shot and got him out of power he fled in a helicopter on top of his roof so understand the principle that there aren't enough guns there aren't enough bullets to kill all of us there aren't 30 million bullets in this country so you can't kill all of us Let me just go quickly to the court case. I have a principle. A certain auntie of mine 
who happens to be an Eswa Supreme Court judge, warned me to be very careful when I talk about court cases. So I'm praying that the Chief Justice will preside over a fair process so that that election petition exercise is reduced to an arithmetical exercise so that whatever needs to be counted will be counted whatever needs to be authenticated will be authenticated so that at the end of the day we know who genuinely won and who genuinely didn't win but i am rest assured that if there is a fair process if the pensions are audited by independent parties not politicians acting as independent parties like the peace council we will know that at the very least nobody crossed 50 percent 50 plus one in rounding up let me just say this that once again if i was wearing a hat i would doff my hat to the 137 gallant men and women of the national democratic congress who stood up to tyranny on the night and early hours of January 7th. Because one fine day, when our children and our grandchildren grow up, they will read and be told the history of how certain brave men and women chased MPs who could eat ballot and gave them a few punches for them to regurgitate the eating ballot. Stories will also be told of how unarmed men and women faced up to military officers, armed to the teeth, helmets, lights, protection, full PPE, ready to battle, camouflage nets, entering the chamber of parliament, stood up to them and walked them out of parliament and told them, this is not a battleground. Get out of here. I say, are you cool to them? And once again, to the MPP government, if you think you are lonely now, wait until tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ibrahim Mohamed, who is a journalist in Tamale, says the tracks Mr. Pratt is talking about normally stopped at Holy Cross Church at Chugu for three days in Tamale to buy some before they proceed to Kumasi and Accra. Uh, this one says, I think Kwesi is a good leader. He should try politics. Some of us will vote for him. Mr. Pratt. Okay. Uh, he says he will say no more. Uh, so let me just, uh, just a few of the messages I may have missed. Um, so this is Chris in the UK. So my humble request to NDC, Senator NDC's attention should be focused on Ghana media and the parliamentarians. Ghana needs to properly audit Nanado's past government. Parliament should bring back the auditor general to audit state books properly. The 1992 constitution needs review. Thanks. Uh, thank you uh, for that message. Uh, also, um, I think I've read this. Uh, this one says Senator Nanado and his government as is subject to every manner of criticism just like any other person so you should spare as a freedom of expression uh Agbanjaro says NPP claimed that they have won elections that Kufuado as their president members of NDC and majority of Ghanaians refused to acknowledge him as the winner members of NPP were crying whilst members of NDC were laughing Senna, where would Ghana have been if members of NDC were like the NPP you say um Elliot Tugbe sends quite a lengthy one says okay so i don't agree with the ndc accepting the wise as the first deputy speaker 
God was the same person who referred to those who were killed as criminals. This means Honorable Carlos Ahinkra should have also been killed because of what he, what he did was a criminal act. This is their character. If the good wouldn't go in favor of them, then it shouldn't favor anybody. It was the same people who were engaging in the time printing at Ligon during the 2008 runoff. And when I appeared there and caught them red-handed, they beat me mercilessly. So the uncle Kusipat, Nambu Tungbuapo, can testify uh, to that. He said, um, they really killed it. Uh, this one is from Esnagio. It says, the truth we can't escape. When wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When wealth is lost, something is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. When character is lost, it's all lost. Billy Graham. A country organization moves almost always reflects the character of its leader. So we can all see where the lost character of a leader is taking this nation to. Um, Kofi Avaji says, and our first deputy speaker said on TV that people killed in Techima were criminals. Kofi Kwachi, we have been making progress as a country under the Fourth Republic and the Kufuado's government took us way back. Tell Mujib that it's not only NDC who went to parliament to win the speakership. We only refused to cooperate because what the MPP was proposing was illegal and unconstitutional. We should not keep repeating the mistake of yesteryears, you said. Uh, so, two from Dr. David Pesci, who says to Nana Kufuado and the MPP, there's no problem that a well-crafted slogan, plus media management and spin, cannot solve. Like, like Nanado plus MPP, I had also come to accept that no one had balls in the NDC. In the night of 6th January and morning of 7th January, my friends started to prove me wrong. A good start, but a long way to go. Dr. Percy says, and let me end uh, with Ambassador Sampial, who sent this one earlier. says, what played out in Parliament was the tertiary implementation of the NPP's formula in the 2020 elections. They came with entrenched position of entitlement. They were sure they would use the court process to disenfranchise the people of Asin North, or as they kept the presence of Ameru. They intended to steal ballot papers through the connivance of their leader and a member of parliament. Finally, they decided to deploy the military to scuttle the voting. They used the marshal to attempt pardoning the ballot box. The NDC intelligence picked all their plans and strategically prepared to face them and beat them to their own. In all these, the double standards and hypocrisy of our chairman Sabonso, who called the NDC all manner of names before the voting, but turned full 36 degrees soon after they had been defeated to start singing the song of unity and cooperation. We in the NDC have learned our lessons and we say never again. We are fully prepared for them in the Supreme Court. And that will start pretty shortly. The election petition is what we are looking forward to. Like I said, there are several other petitions that are in the court. You, know, you saw 13 months out, there's one in court. Don't forget the Santuko Fiakwa Lobby issue, liquid issue still remains unresolved. And also the issue of a synod is also still in court. My name is Sena Numbu. A big thank you to Anko Kusipai, you know, his manager of the Inside Newspaper. Mr. Kojutun Bafo is a leading member of the National Democratic Congress. Uh, Mujib Brahman is a member of the NDC, NPP's, the New Patriotic Party's communication team. And then, sitting right beside him, is Margaret Anse, who is the immediate past uh, deputy spokesperson of the NDC's 2020 national campaign team. Once again, Thank you for making time. A big thank you to Ahunta 92.3 FM. A big thank you to Volta One TV, Sela Radio. A big thank you to Benya Radio, among the several other radio stations that took us live wherever they were. We are always grateful. And thank you very much for your comments and contributions. Uh, from the crew here at Pan African TV, led by Emma Pratt and, of course, uh, Kwame Oso Danso, and then uh, uh, Selom, and my very good, my, my producer, Tijani. A big thank you for making time. We are back same time next week with another edition of the show. Enjoy your weekend and the rest of the week.